My friends, welcome back to the Strength of Seduction podcast, the number one resource for black couples who want to build intimacy, love, and connection in their marriage. I'm your host, Daniel DiPiazza, and if you're new here, you're watching this on YouTube, for instance, make sure to like and subscribe, hit that bell for updates. If you're listening to this on your favorite podcast platform like Apple or Spotify, make sure to subscribe and leave a review. We really appreciate it. We have an incredible episode for you today, uh, all about sex and intimacy in your marriage, and we interviewed one of my favorite people in this space. Her name is Maisha Battle, and she is a clinical certified sexologist. She's a sex coach and relationship coach, and she's been doing this for about a decade now, and she knows her stuff. The way I like to think about Maisha's teachings is, is almost like adult sex ed. Many of us, we get sex ed in maybe elementary, middle school, high school at some point, but then we kind of stop talking about what makes us feel good, what we don't understand about sex, uh, what we want to learn as we get older. And a lot of us get frustrated because of it. This applies to both men and women. It can be a sensitive topic, a touchy topic. And that's why we bring experts into our Love and Legacy coaching program to help our couples learn about this area of their lives, which is obviously very important. And if you've been listening to any of our content recently, you know sex and intimacy is one of the four pillars of a happy home. So in Love and Legacy, we always bring these guys experts in, and I like to share small snippets of this conversation uh, between Maisha, who's one of our experts, and also our clients, our students. Now, just as a as a reminder, I won't actually be sharing any of the actual students asking questions, the, the customers asking questions, just because we want to keep everyone's information private, and it's a safe space to have those conversations. But I will be sharing my questions to Maisha and Maisha's responses to people uh, without context for who that person is. But you're going to get a lot, almost like a fly on the wall, listening to this conversation with Maisha. Now, if you do like what you want to hear and you want to learn more about the Love and Legacy program, you can just go to strengthofseduction.com forward slash legacy to get some more info. And without further ado, let's get to this podcast. Okay. So I thought maybe there would be like, we'll do the, we'll do the warm up into maybe some question and answer. And perhaps a good way to start would be, I love your concept of adult sex ed. And what are the things that adults don't really know about sex until maybe later in their lives and they might need to start thinking about. Yeah, most of us have a lot of gaps when it comes to sex that get filled in by culture, by media, but not necessarily by the realities that a lot of people face. In one of our chats, I talked about how sexological research is difficult to conduct. It's possible to conduct, but people love to lie about their sex lives. And so what we have floating around to compare ourselves to are like media representations, things that are happening to our friends or things that they say are happening to them. Again, may not be fully the truth and then our own experience. And so largely there's a gap between what people experience in their sex lives and what they see or what they've internalized is normal. Most sexologists hate the term normal because it really is limiting and can make us feel like even more isolated. So on one hand, I think it's really good to acknowledge that we have this sort sort of like cultural messaging that can make us feel abnormal. And then we also have this medical model that says, if you fall within this range, then you are normal, but anything outside of that, it's a problem. So even when people have sexual concerns and they go seeking help, mostly people are going to counselors, therapists, maybe doctors, physicians, OBGYNs, et cetera. And those are places where those folks have not received a lot of sexological training. So they're bringing in their own bias. They're limited in terms of what they can do for support. And let me tell you, I've heard a lot of really unhelpful things that physicians have said, not hashtag, not all physicians, not all counselors and therapists, but I think it's worth recognizing too, that there's a couple layers to this issue where we're trying to figure out is what's happening with me normal? And then we're going to seek help in places where people have a very narrow view of what normal is and are seeing it through a medical lens and also don't have the right training. (laughs) So if you've ever felt like your sex life is just hard to wrangle or get your brain around, that's why when you're trying to compare yourself to all of these other things and external experiences, it can feel really difficult. That's why I do love saying that I provide adult sex ed 
And it's what kind of launched this year. I have a, a better sex easing, but we really are going back to basics. Sex ed really doesn't include pleasure anatomy. It doesn't include pleasure as a focus really at all. Yeah, that's so true. I just think about that. There was never a mention ever of pleasure in sex ed. It was just like, here's the part. Don't touch this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Here's what not to do. So I say most people got prevention education, preventing pregnancy, preventing STIs, all of that. But we really didn't get comprehensive sex ed. Even some things come down to mechanics. I don't want to discredit that. But a lot of the things that we struggle with in our sex lives come down to we're just not aware of our own anatomy and how it works and the anatomy of our partners. And that's really where sex coaching can help fill in the gaps. Um, and as I mentioned, the easing is, is also there for people to like go on a deep dive and yeah, we just released the penis issue, which like most people are like, penises are so simple, but I'm like, surprise, they're not. And I think that's something that we should all be aware of and and be curious about. Can you speak more to, I think both partners would appreciate a stronger mental connection and a stronger psychological stimulation. And I think that we don't talk about that enough. And maybe you had some experience with couples who were able to really improve that. Yeah, of course. I think that this tends to take a lot of different forms. For instance, when couples come to me and they're at the point where they're just basically living parallel lives. So there's not a lot of overlap in the activities they do together. Um, there's just maybe a lot of device usage on the phones all the time. There's always something in between their ability to connect. That requires a lot of intervention in terms of figuring out how to just come back together as a couple and figure out what that means. But there's also a shade of this that is, I think, a little less extreme, which I see more often, which is like everything else just gets put on the top of our priority list to the point where, you know, sexual connection or just non-sexual intimacy gets deprioritize in the relationship over time and it's you don't even really think about it or one partner may think about it more than the other partner um and i think that there's a misconception where we think about relationships as having some kind of destination end point where it's like you're dating you're courting you're engaged, you're married, you have kids, you're settled. And there's this kind of natural progression in my world. We call that the relationship escalator where things just go up and you can't really get off at any point. You're just like going up together. And in that situation, I think it's, it, it can be very easy to lose your partner in the day to day where they become someone who you talk about logistics with, you talk about planning the next vacation, yes, but that's like months off. You talk about the day-to-day -day household things. And we miss those moments of like, how are you? Like, how are you actually doing? And I see this in my relationship too. I'm not immune to it. But those moments where there is reconnection when we can, you know, sit and have an actual conversation where the two of us are really opening up to each other and talking about not just the everyday mundane things, that's where intimacy really can grow. And it's, it's that mental connection. It's also a mental shift from the day-to-day -day stuff that I'm just constantly navigating and maneuvering. And so is my partner to, okay, we have this designated space where we are just two people who fell in love and have a lot of stuff in common. We've just not focused on that or we're not really as tuned into that as we may like to be and that's again where sexual energy actually gets ignited as well so yeah i'll pause there and see if people have any thoughts or comments the question one of our love and legacy members just asked was how do you find the time when you're busy with the kids when you're feeling exhausted when work is all you can ever really think about and then all you want to do when you get home is sleep how do you find the time to bring intimacy into the relationship to make sex exciting and fun again and to make it be um, exciting and not a chore. 
And so here is Maisha's answer. Yeah, it's a great question. And it really requires a logistical answer from the two of you. The classic mode of we have a date night, we come home and have sex. Like it really doesn't work for busy people, period. It also doesn't work for a lot of people who have families and obligations and you're just exhausted. Another thing to think about is like, when do you have the time? And it doesn't have to be a whole lot of time, but it has to be like that private time. And what I like to do is usually ask people like what resources they have. Not everybody has family nearby that they could turn to, you know, for childcare, et cetera. But if you do, how can you start to build that in as sort of relationship maintenance? Like we must have this time. It is a non-negotiable for our relationship. Therefore, we are making this either investment in a babysitter or we are making an arrangement with family to help us out to maintain that. When they say it takes a village to raise a child, that is true. And I also am a firm believer that it takes a village to maintain a relationship. Like you need help. <laughs> so I don't want you to feel like this is all just on you. Yes, it's up to you to figure out where in your life there can be space created. And for some people, it's just like, those morning moments. It might be really early in the morning before the kids come and attack you. It could be just those moments where you get to steal some time with each other. The benefit to morning, which is something that a lot of people are like, ah, mornings, ah, I don't know. Benefit to morning, especially for men, is that testos testosterone is at its highest in the morning hours. And so you can capitalize on that. Showers, showers together. Yeah. Showers together intimate time when you can find 15, 20 minutes. And again, I want us to also think about how intimacy is not always sex. So having intimacy means making time for the non-sexual parts of our relationship as well. So even just like getting soapy together once a week, is like a cute thing to do. It's a nice thing. It feels great. You get to start your day out nice. Like feeling good and feeling connected. Um, so expanding to what your expectations are. Don't let yourself get limited into, we have to have sex this many times a week or whatever. Like as long as you are making a consistent effort and I'm a big fan of really holding that space, really holding that time on the calendar or during your day. And of course life comes up, you have to reschedule, but reschedule, make sure that you're intentionally saying, hey, we've got people coming in and staying at the house. We can't do our normal date this week but when can we find time when's the next time we can do this so i hope that's helpful did you have any thoughts or reactions to that no i'm just glad you also mentioned like the time is not just about sex because i feel like that's where we kind of struggle i'm all about the cuddling just the hanging out the petting the whatever and he's no i can't do that unless some it's leading somewhere and it, it just is it's just one of those things it's like, yeah but this is what i have the mental and physical capacity for and so it just, it's like a rolling stone sometimes in our relationship from that i am seeking that emotional connection which wants me to be more physical yeah, yeah. so you just described something that there's a lot of people commenting i think there's different types of desire and what you just described is to me like a classic example of responsive desire. This varies. It's not a hard and fast rule, but I tend to see my clients who are women in partnerships with men, not exclusively, but women tend to be more on the responsive desire side of things where you may not be thinking about sex from day to day. You may be really in need and craving that physical connection through non-sexual intimacy. So yeah, I think it's important to take the wins when you get them, but also recognize that a win may be not having sex now for the opportunity to have sex later because you've built a foundation of trust that like you're not just cuddling to have sex. It's like counterintuitive, but it's also, I think... From what I've experienced, it's that I think women just need to feel more emotionally connected and secure before that part of their brain is going to get turned on. That's been my experience. 
Yeah. And I have seen this with male clients too. So I don't want to say that this doesn't happen for men, but, and it can change throughout your life span as well. People who are more spontaneous in their desire, which is the counterpart to responsive desire. Somebody just commented about bell hooks talking about sexual performance and sexual satisfaction um, and the nuts and bolts. I think like when you're somebody who has spontaneous desire, it's almost like the thought of sex is just like a running script in the back and it will move forward from time to time, right? You'll have a spontaneous thought about sex and want to have sex. And that can be a real challenge in relationships when one of you is more spontaneous in feeling desire for your partner versus someone who needs the context to be right, needs to feel calm and safe. And again, these are things that we think about that women want, but I also want to say I've worked with plenty of men who need that to be true too, need distractions to be limited, need some buildup or time. And this can also be a difference that we see if, say, a partner is struggling with anxiety. Folks with anxiety have a harder time switching gears from day-to-day -day life to I'm relaxed enough and feel like I can let go of control enough to have sex. So these differences do exist in partnership for a variety of reasons. Again, all very common. All of it is quote-unquote normal. So if you're somebody who's with somebody who's a man and seems to have this type of desire or drive and it's frustrating to you, it's, it's fine. If you were in another relationship, you might have another issue, right? It's, we're all different. And I think just recognizing the differences in how we both behave, because the problem is when we start expecting somebody to act the way we want them to, or respond to the things that we're doing the way we want them to. And that's not their normal, finding a way to bridge the gap. And that's why I think this terminology is really helpful. If someone knows that they have responsive desire, they can then say, here are the things that I need, whether it's time, whether it's a back rub or some cuddle time or whatever, here are the things that I need that I think are going to help me get turned on. And it's not that they don't want to have sex. Most of the people that I work with who have responsive desire are like, when I have sex, it's great. Like, that's not the issue. It's just the wanting to want sex. I think my partner is very attractive. I just don't have the internal drive to want to have sex the same way that they seem to. And that can be a really tricky situation to navigate if you don't know what you're working with. It just feels really bad <laughs> for both people, to be honest. And I do think that like intimacy, because it's a very broad term and can include sex, it has a lot of different interpretations for every single person. And depending on how you grew up and what messages you internalized about intimacy, those can be enacted in your relationship as well. There can be a lot of quote unquote performance anxiety. I don't like performance anxiety as a term because I don't like sex as a performance. That's part of my whole thing as a feminist. I'm like, we're not here to perform. This is a shared experience. We both opted into this. Let's have a good time. Like that's not, we're not here to perform. But what I do is the term sexual anxiety. And I think when I say that people relate to that, I think across the spectrum, because there's a lot about sex that is anxiety inducing. Does this person want to have sex with me? How am I going to maybe engage with them in such a way that they will want to have sex with me? Then once we are about to have the physical act of sex, like what is it that I'm doing? What is it that they're doing? How do I look? How do I feel? All these things. And that's why one of the best practices that I know as a sex coach to combat all that, you know, judgment and all of that worry that goes into sex is to really have a strong meditation practice. Why? Because practicing meditation helps you to be more in the present moment and being more in the present moment takes you out of that state of worry of, am I doing it right? Is this the right thing? Am I going to accomplish the goal? It's, I don't know why people worry so much about one specific act of sex, because over the lifetime, you're going to have sex a bunch of times, so many times, right? Even if you don't, if you, even if you've only had sex with one person, you're still going to have sex, presumably. These are, we're talking to couples here. So lots of times you've had, already had sex, 
lots of times you are going to have sex. There's just a lot of anxiety about the amount of sex that's happening. And nine times out of 10, when I'm working with clients, like I'm working to help them to take their mind off of the frequency so much and to really focus on the quality. Because when you're having quality sex and you are not thinking about anything else, but your pleasure, your partner's pleasure, that is more remarkable and leaves more of an impression than just, oh, we had sex five times this week or seven times this week. It's great to be able to say that, but you're the only one who's counting. It's, it's, it's really something to be able to say, I felt amazing because I was fully there for that. And I remember these nuances of it that are really hot to me, but a lot of people can't get there because they're focused on 